everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I hope that everybody is having uh, an awesome day. I hope that you had a productive and prosperous week. Uh, whatever has transpired, whatever you have gone through, whatever you may be going through, uh, there's still an opportunity to do more. There's still an opportunity to improve. Uh, if you're in a situation currently that you are not satisfied or happy with, you can change that. It re requires a commitment. It requ requires consistency. It requires a belief that it's possible. And once you have a belief in yourself, the belief uh, is so important. It is the limiting beliefs that corral people. People believe it's impossible, and it is. People believe that they can break through the barriers of what's uh, perceived as impossible, and they do. It has happened for centuries, and it will continue to happen. This is how the world has been designed to operate. Uh, so don't feel like you're trapped in something that you're not happy with. You have to make a committed, uh, uh, committed uh, effort to change it and be committed. And, and when I say committed, it's exactly what I mean. I mean, you can't be in it in, as long as it feels good. You can't be in it just as long as you can see a little progress. You can't just be in it for as long as it makes sense. You've got to make up in your mind, this is not what I want for myself and I'm going to change it. I'm going to uh, achieve that thing I desire or I will die trying. I will not give up. Um, far too many people give up. Um, a friend of mine posted some months back that if you want, if you're tired of starting over, stop quitting. And that is huge. If you're, if you're tired of starting over, stop quitting. It, it's that simple. Um, so I'm wishing everybody the best. If you had a rough week, press the reset button. Um, we'll talk to you about some things today that will really open your eyes to some things and give you a blueprint of how to set the state for today and set the course for tomorrow and literally have a stronghold on your future. Uh, so the uh, before I get into that, if you haven't gotten critical mass, get it. If you haven't signed up for our free breakthrough session, get it. Um, Everything you need to know is going to be in the uh, post box, description box, depending on what platform you're watching this on. It's posted on, it'll be posted on quite a few platforms. So whatever platform you're watching on, where the con written content information is stored, description box, post box, blah, blah, blah. Get there and find what it is you need and get there. If it's something else you don't want, I actually have a couple of spots open that I'm looking to work with someone. If you want to work with someone for 12 weeks to a year to totally change your life. I have spots and anyone that has worked with me can tell you what they've experienced while working with me. Uh, I have an unbelievably high success rate. I get the job done. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, I have a few spots, a couple, a couple of spots uh, available. I'm pretty sure it may be three, but I can only think of two now. Uh, but I have a couple of spots available. If you're someone who's worked with me in the past and you know someone that you know would benefit from what uh, I do, uh, either refer them or if you're in a position to do so, gift them uh, this opportunity. It's an investment worth it. Uh, if you've worked with me, you know this. With that being said, I'm going to move off into what I want to talk about. I want to talk to you about a deeper investigation into the world of psychosomatics and so much more. Psychosomatics is the uh, scientific expression or revelation that what you think impacts your health, your physical health. And it's so much more than this. And I'm gonna get into it. I'm gonna tell you how I've arrived where I'm at in this field of expertise and how I use it to work with my clients in numerous ways. Okay, psychosomatic simply says that what you think will impact your health. If you are thinking, you're worried, you're stressed, uh, you're anxious, it's going to show up in your physicality. But 
now through the study of epigenetics, we're learning that the, the more intricate details of how it's happening. And so we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna talk about the importance of being in a position to create the best environment because environment is key into what we're gonna talk about. So how we see life and its experiences, perception, determines our behavior and it controls so many elements of our existence that we're unaware of. Uh, there used to be a belief, you know, with the discovery of DNA and genetics, we've heard over and over and over again, you know, it's a genetic inherit, uh, it, it, it's inherited genetically. It's a genetic uh, condition. Uh, it runs in the family. And what we're finding out is what runs in the family most of the time is not the genetics in and of itself, uh, but more predominantly the environment. The environment includes what you eat, how you engage one another, the level of comfort, safety, security, uh, uh, support, uh, and so many other things lend to it. And I came about this understanding of epigenetics, uh, and I've had a chance to write and speak on an international level on this, but it started with me simply trying to understand and validate my belief in multi-generational transmission of trauma as it pertains specifically to the descendants of slaves. And uh, because there was this argument at the time that uh, it's been a hundred, at the time that I started this, it's been 130 something years, it's been 150 now, but at, at, at the time it's been 130 something years, uh, it's time to let it go. Uh, slavery was over back then. They weren't considering the re-injury after slavery, you know, reconstruction, black codes, convict leasing, redlining, Jim Crow segregation, urban renewal, right, benign neglect, uh, and so many other things that uh, negatively impacted blacks that were uh, considered to be a traumatic experience. And, and, and it continues today. And so they didn't do that. But I was looking at, okay, are we passing down trauma? In other words, are each, uh, is each new generation born with a head start, a new start, a fresh start, or are they born with the burdens of past trauma? And so I discovered in time you know, I, I discovered a bunch of ways that generational trauma was definitely being passed down. But I, I discovered in time the, the science of epigenetics and how it's evolved. And epigenetics basically speaks to the ability of the environment, first and foremost, to impact genetic expression. And what does that mean? That a bunch of genes that you're born with, you get 23 chromosomes from your mom and 23 chromosomes from your father and that forms your 46 chromosomes and with that comes some ge genetic predispositions you're going to get your height your your, your your complexion a bunch of other things but even deeper there are these things called epigenetic tags tags are something that develops over time based on environment the more emphatic a an experience a traumatic experience the more ingrained the tag. Now, through the re, uh, reproductive process uh, known as meiosis, where cells are uh, basically reproduce, reproduce themselves, and then you go through the reproductive process, most tags are erased. This is nature's way of giving each new uh, individual on the planet a fresh start. In other words, you're not constantly being piled on. The problem is we've learned that the more emphatic a traumatic experience, the less likely that that genetic tag will be completely erased through the reproductive process. So that kid is literally born with trauma that the parent or the grandparent experienced. And so that was one way. But here's another thing that happens. Epigenetics also investigates the environment, how the environment of an individual impacts them and their health. Say, for instance, cancer. Um, and I've, I've actually was invited to speak in Frankfurt, Germany, on the impact of epigenetics on the development of cancer. See, 
we talk about genetics and all of this, but we don't talk about gene expression um, and the rewriting of code. But in gene expression, everybody's born with disease genes. It's not like some people have a disease gene and some people don't. Everybody has disease genes, but those genes have to be turned on. And epigenetics explains how genes are turned on and off. And what happens is disease genes require a certain amount of negative energy, negative environment, negative influence. Well, that can come in a number of different ways. The introduction of carcinogens is one. The uh, introduction of poor nutrition is another. But probably one of the most prominent and less discussed is environment. We find out that in stressful environments, abusive environments, where it's a lot of stress, a lot of worry, a lot of anger, all negative vibrational uh, flows, anything under 250 hertz is coming in and it's hitting and it's turning on disease genes. Did you know that for most cancers, there has to be at least 13 to 14 disease genes turned on and active simultaneously for a person to get cancer? It's not as simple and easy and as common as they would make you believe. And a lot of it can be controlled and there can be a reversal and a healing by the same understanding of what perception is creating. Perception is created. Your perception of your environment creates a situation. Because, and why, why do I know this to be true? Because number one, there's a lot of pragmatic and empirical data that proves it. But in, 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 in the most simplistic observation of, of, of life, what you see are two people in the same environment, roughly the same age, come out of a situation, better yet, Two people identically genetic, twins, uh, identical twins, uh, a split ovum, identically genetic. I mean, down to the fingerprints, same. They're identically genetic, genetically I identical. And they start out together, same environment, but one perceives it a different way than the other. They're individual in thinking. While they're identical in appearance, and genetically, they still have their own individual mind, and their perceptions are developing over time as they experience life. One is believing that everything is possible. One sees everything through a glossy lens. The other sees the darkness and everything. And what we don't see initially is that it's infecting, it's affecting their biology. Your perception literally impacts your biology. So over time, you start to see that even the appearance inside and out is happening. Even the appearance starts to change. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace uh, back at you for part two of Quantum Reality Friday. Your perception of life's experiences controls your biology. Uh, I do apologize for the disruptions. For the people who are seeing the stream live on Facebook, you will have two parts. You'll have the first part uh, before the disruption, and then you'll have this one, which will be part two. For everyone else who will be watching the recorded version, it will be edited and be in one block, so you can just disregard this. And we're gonna move right back into what we were discussing in the pre previous segment about the importance of understanding influence uh, environmental influence, the perceptional influence and beliefs. Your perceptions create your biological reality. People don't get that. Uh, there are a lot of people who have argued the philosophy or concept or idea that perception is reality. And it's reality on a number of different levels. It's a reality on a behavioral level. And people ask why. Well, if a person believes, uh, I always give something a little shocking. Uh, I, I may change it in the future, but I always use this because it, because because number one, I've seen it. And I've you know, had to counsel families who, in which this happened. If a person perceives that their spouse is cheating, in their minds, they're seeing evidence that their spouse is being unfaithful. Now, the truth is the, the spouse isn't being unfaithful. They're misreading the evidence for whatever reason. It could be a number of different reasons why they are misreading the evidence, but they're misreading it. In their mind, their wife is cheating on them. Why is it in the most primitive of ways reality? Because how they react to it is real. It's going to produce a real result based on the perception, not the truth. Now, 
in the worst case scenario, person loses their mind, attacks and kills their wife based off something that was never true, but it was perceived. It became reality. Here's what happens on a more in-depth level from an epigenetic perspective. When you believe someone is being unfaithful to you, disloyal to you, someone you are investing in, someone you've promised to love for the rest of your life, it creates a chemical shift. The way you feel, there's a release of cortisol, there was a the release of adrenaline, and it, it's consistent. It's what we call chronic stress. It's having an impact on your biology. But more importantly, as you begin to worry and become stressed, it's having an epigenetic impact at even a more molecular level. Now we're talking about gene expression. We're talking about genes that were turned off being turned on because of the stress, because of the constant stress, the environment, the belief that something's wrong, and so much more. Now, the proclivity or the risk of uh, developing an, a, a, a disease, cancer, uh, ischemic heart disease, coronary heart disease, diabetes, all of these can be directly connected to epigenetic influences. It's not simply that you didn't exercise. It's not simply that you didn't eat right. It's not that you inherited the disease. You inherited an environment of stress that contributes to the turning on of these genes that are necessary for you to develop a disease. In other words, uh, in, in an ideal situation, a person is eating right, a person is exercising, a person is thinking right, expecting positive, thinking positive, being positive, and uh, even perceiving some negative situations as opportunities for more positive results. All of this is perception. It is how they believe and they focus and they live life. But what you will find is their perception is producing their realities, how they think and how they believe is literally producing their reality. There was a test done over 40 years ago before we even got to a point where we are in the knowledge of how powerful our thinking is and how uh, emphatic our environment is. And there was a test done on students, I believe if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, graduates, uh, a, a graduate class of Yale University. And they broke down this study into a couple of parts. The part that caught my attention was they labeled them uh, optimistic and pessimistic. The optimists based on the uh, researchers, always saw their situation better than it really was. They, they had their head in the clock, so to speak. They always saw their, their uh, situation uh, better than it was. However, the pessimist was by all means, when you measured everything from a quantitative standpoint, they were very accurate or clearly more accurate in assessing their reality than the, the optimist was. The optimist always saw things better than it was. The pessimist in this group always saw things pretty much how it was, but they were pessimistic in their view. They didn't see the positive in it, they just saw the reality. They weren't able to interpret it in a way that it benefited them, they just saw the reality. Well, they came back 20 years later and they saw they they they, they re uh interviewed uh the survivors of this class and what they found is the optimists though initially they saw things in their lives much better than it really was found a way to rise up to what they saw in other words because they saw saw something in their lives better than it really was at the time their perception of it created an environment in multiple ways that opened the gate for them to actually achieve it. Well, the pessimist had either remained stagnant or had regressed. In other words, things had gotten worse. They, through this constant perception of negativity, created a negative environment through which they experienced experience negative experience after experience because of their perception. Perception, your perceptions are what create your beliefs about this world, your beliefs is what controls your biology. When you believe something bad is gonna happen, it impacts your biology. First, immediately and initially through a stress response. And that stress response, if it is not 
intervened, if it is not interrupted, if it is not corrected, will become what we call chronic stress. And that's when you have adrenaline and cortisol being released into the body consistently, something that was never meant to be. Adrenaline and cortisol are stress management hormones. What it's meant to do is create an environment in which stress at the, you got to think about the evolution of humanity. At, at, when this part of the brain, when this, uh, what we call reptilian part of the brain, uh, senses a threat. Back then, let's just say it was a saber-toothed tiger or something, you know, that far back. That's that was the stress response. You could sense it. It was danger. I've got to either defend myself with my spear or I've got to be fast on my feet and I've got to run. Whatever that whichever one I choose, I'm going to need all of the blood and the oxygen to have as much energy as I need to either fight or run at my extremities. My extremities are what I used to fight and run with. So the blood stops flowing to the brain, to the heart, to, and other places where it's needed on a regular basis, and it flows to the extremities. So you've got this massive push of uh, uh, energy and oxygen to your extremities, but your brain is suffering, your heart is suffering, your liver is suffering, your kid, because it's not meant to be long term. It's meant to be a few seconds. I'm going to either fight and win or whatever happens, or I'm going to run. Once I get to safety, if I'm going to run, or once I eliminate the threat, if I'm going to fight, everything starts to slow down. Your heart rate slows. Your blood starts to redistribute to all of the necessary places. In which to, you got to understand, one of the reasons people don't make good decisions when they're in a stressed mode is because your executive functions are controlled by your prefrontal lobe. It takes about 30% uh, of your total blood flow and oxygen supply goes to the prefrontal lobe. That's your executive function. That's where you make choices. That's where you have your um, uh, inhibiting functions, things that tell you don't do that. That's stupid. That's why people who are suffering from stress and going through things can't make good decisions. You say, uh, we, we sit up and say all the time, that was just dumb. That was stupid. What, what the hell were they thinking? They weren't thinking. They were reacting because they had moved into such an instinctive uh, state of, of being that the, 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 the uh, prefrontal cortex is pretty much non-functional. Non and that's what happens. You are trying to fight or run. You're trying to get to safety. What happens when your stress is being triggered by your job? That's every day, at least four to five days a week. How do you escape that? How do you eliminate the threat when you are literally stressed about your job? What if you're in a relationship <laughs> in which you are stressed? Now, your, 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 your reptilian brain does not know that it's not a fight or flight situation. It simply senses this stress moment as a threat and it behaves the same. So your decision-making faculties are off. Your reasoning and rationale is off, and so much so much more. Now, uh, easing back into what we were talking about as far as the epigenetic influence, the environmental influence, your perception of things, control your perception. This group of Yale graduates, one thought the world was glossed, and they created a glossed world. It didn't mean that they didn't experience negative things. It means that even when they experienced the negative things, they found the positive in it. Have you ever seen a person that no matter what happens, they find joy? They're not in denial. They just choose to look at things differently. They decide that, hey, I've got one life to live. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm not going to be governed by my situations. I'm not going to be governed by my condition. I'm going to be governed by the belief that at the end of my life, I will have lived a full and prosperous and fulfilling life. And I'm going to enjoy it all the way along. And there are going to be some rough spots. I've been in some very rough places. I've done uh, some great things. I've experienced some great things. I've had an awesome life and everything is considered. But I've had some rough spots where I had to, I had to uh, for lack of a better term, I had to I had to man up. And the way that I did it is simply, and you, those who have followed me know that I, I looked myself in the mirror, literally. 
And I looked myself eye to eye and I said, you're built for this. Everything you've gone through in your past that didn't make sense to you before makes sense now because it was preparing you for this moment. You've heard me say this before, that when you discover your purpose, it will explain your pain. Well, you have to understand how am I going to look at life, the beliefs that I have about life. Now, I'm going to get through this real briefly, but I want you to kind of understand how this, things work, how this thing works. The origin of perception, there are three basic origins of perception are the ability to manage perception. The first origin of perception is genetics. What do you mean by that? There's certain things you're born in, uh, with that you're genetic, genetically instinctive uh, that you're able to do. Uh, genetically instinctive. And one, 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 if a baby reaches and touches something hot, can't even talk, just move on. You don't have to teach it to take its hand off once it touches it instinctively remove it. Something else a lot of people don't know that babies are born instinctively able to swim and loving water. You can have births underwater. The baby will come up and immediately be able to float, protect itself, and will turn on its back to be able to breathe. It's, 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 it's crazy and it's amazing. So then we know instinctively there are certain behaviors and perceptions that you're born with. The perception in the field of water isn't, uh, isn't genetic. It's not instinctive. Instinctively, babies love water. So what happens is, if you want to work, want to understand why so many kids can't swim, or why you have to teach every kid, well, almost every kid to swim at some point, is the second uh, second uh, uh, origin of perception, and that's the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is constantly downloading information, especially between birth and six or seven years old. It's downloading information and it's determining from the information it's downloading how to engage life. What will hurt me? What will harm? What will help me? What's good? What's bad? What's acceptable? What's unacceptable? It's learning how to navigate through life in a social environment and an environment that can be very harmful and dangerous uh, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. And it's learning the best way to navigate it based on the environment it's exposed to. Now, obviously, if it's exposed to a very harmful environment, its perceptions are going to be skewed. And it's, it will be different if it's exposed to a very highly functional and secure and safe environment. The perceptions are going to be different. Well, uh, what happens with kids who have to be taught how to swim is that parents have a fear of a baby drowning anytime a baby gets near water. Parents lose their freaking minds because in their minds, the baby's gonna drown. Well, the baby's downloading. So the baby is looking and is perceiving your perception of what's gonna happen. So now it's developing a fear of water. If you ever notice when parents first take the kids to go see, uh, to the beach, to the pool, wherever, you get in with the water, the kids like hanging on for dear life, why? Because every time you've put me around water, you've You've literally gone to 10 and you've been anxious, you've been worried, you've been fearful. And so now I've trained myself subconsciously to behave the same way. And so now my biology is impacted by the sight of water. And big bodies of water, will, the bigger the body of the water, the more freaked out I'm going to become. Think about it. People who are not acclimated to large bodies of water. Think about how it is when you're riding down to the beach and you get and you see where the land in and you see all this water. Or when you're riding over this big bridge of all this water, think about the things that go through your mind if you have a fear of water. Some of us were reared around water and we see it differently, but a lot of people aren't. And a lot of people have developed these fears. Well, that's a subconscious thing. That's something that you have to be aware of. Now, the beautiful thing about all of this, and I'm going to get into this next week, is that it can be reprogrammed. Uh, neuroplasticity tells us that we can reprogram our entire perception, our entire subconscious programming can be changed to be beneficial to and conducive to the things that we want to achieve. But we have to be aware of that. Now, the third modicum or the third method of perception is consciousness. And it begins with self consciousness, awareness of self and self consciousness. Now, self consciousness is the most powerful and there are people who have followed me that are probably going how is that possible because you've heard me say that the subconscious mind controls 96 percent of what we do absolutely absolutely true 
96% of your behavior every day is controlled subconsciously. Things you do automatically without even thinking about it or having to make a conscious decision to do it is automatic. You don't have time if somebody jumps out in front of you uh, while you're driving to go through a conscious uh, situation. Uh, I have an emergency call. I'm going to have to jump off of this and I'm going to have to finish this some of the time because this is about the sixth time that it's called and it's leaving message. So I'm going to have to check that. Well, anyway, let me jump off of here. I'm going to deal with this and I'll get back to you guys later. But I think you get the idea. With that being said, I'm going to jump off and take this call. Hello? I, I didn't recognize the number and I was doing a video. And I, didn't think, uh, I, I figured it was something. But, uh, it's still 